Hey everyone, thanks for coming along and watching my first video of 2024. I know it's been a long time. This video was actually shot in December of 2023, but I'm just getting around to editing it with my busy work schedule. But before I get into the video, I wanted to share a few things with you. The first is that, you know, sometimes if you've worked on manual transmissions and you've worked especially with gear lubricants, you know how awful they can smell and well, some people might like that smell of gear lube. It never really gets off your clothes, never gets off the garage floor, anything like that. It's always there. But it's a high viscosity fluid, right? So I was walking around a store, and again, I don't make any money off or any of this stuff like that. I just wanted to share this with you. I thought it was I thought it was funny. This is called Duke Cannon High Viscosity Body Wash. And it says Buffalo Trace. I think this is the closest fragrance I've ever seen in a body wash that kind of smells like gear lube. So I kind of like it, but it kind of gets me in the mood to build transmissions. But here it is, Duke Cannon Thick High Viscosity Body Wash. So if you're using high viscosity oils, I'm sure you're gonna to wanna to use this as well. But again, I'm not promoting this. They haven't paid me for it. I just thought it was funny. The other is my book that I am promoting. My book, Building and Modifying High Performance Manual Transmissions, shows you how to rebuild different transmissions, basic five basic transmissions of the T10, the Super T10, the Muncie 4-speed, the Ford Top Loader, Chrysler AA33, and uh, T5s. Now, the reason why I bring this up, because in this video today, I am going to do a disassembly of an early General Motors T10 4-speed. And... The four-speed transmission is in pretty bad shape, and I'm going to convert the inside of it to a late model Super T10. Now, the reason why this is important is because now you can get the advantage of better gear ratios from the later transmissions, not to mention the strength, but in a C1 Corvette where the tunnel is very narrow and the shifter opening is very narrow, you don't want to really, I guess, put an aftermarket shifter in it or something that can be very difficult to get through this tiny hole. It's, it's something like that in, in the floor pan of the car. And so by utilizing certain components of the original T10 combined with Super T10s, I've created this hybrid transmission that I think is a really good success and I think people are really gonna like it. It's based on some exclusive parts that I helped design with my friend Brian at SK Transmissions up in New York. So you can get the parts from Brian, I'll send you links below, or you can get a whole kit from me if you want to do that. And that's it. So let's get to this video, and thanks for watching. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't, and all the links to everything I'm talking about is in the video description below. Please take the time to read those links, and also all my contact information is below in the video. All right, so here we have an early T10 four-speed transmission. A few things I want you to notice. It's got an iron case. This does not have a front seal in it. This has just basically a, a slinger system in it like the Muncie's. Speedometer is on the driver's side. And I want you to look at the orientation of these shifter shafts. They're all kind of at a, a one o'clock position when it's in neutral. So what we want to do is we're going to convert this over to a late model Super T10 gear train inside using a special adaptive main shaft so that we can utilize all the exact pieces of this except I'm going to change the case to a later model aluminum case but leave everything else the same so that the shifter and everything will fall exactly into place. We're going to have to change the clutch disc because it's going to be 26 by now and the output shaft instead of 16 spline is going to be 27 spline. Now the 16 spline output shafts that are in here always have a tendency to twist. We'll see if that's twisted when we take it apart and find out here. Somebody was in this before, so I don't know what to expect, but I think it's broken from what I remember, and it's pretty well hammered, the unit. So to try and repair this unit would cost a lot of money, and I'm working on actually machining the cases to accept late model gears. So normally we'd have nine bolts. This cover looks like it's got a little bit of a crack in it too from being over tightened, maybe without gaskets, I don't know. So this is dated 1959, this cover, okay? Fork's actually look in really good shape. 
excellent shape actually, but they're kind of the wrong forks for this. Uh, it's got broken gears. Hear that? Broken gears. If I spin this around over here, you can see that broken tooth over here. Now, I want you to notice how thin these gears are, okay? They, they're actually almost the same kind of diameters as Muncie gears, but they were much thinner on these early boxes. So they had a tendency to break if you put any power to them. Don't forget, these particular transmissions in the early 60s and the late 50s were not designed for serious power. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to take the four bolts off of the bearing retainer. Get that out of the way. The way this retainer is popping off, I have a feeling nobody used a gasket on it. Maybe they used some sealant. I don't know. Yeah, no gasket. Right. So, somebody's been in this before. Now, oftentimes too, people will take the retainer off and then they'll go, oh, look, it moves in and out. Well, that's what the retainer does. It holds the bearing in place. It's supposed to do that. In order for you to get the extension housing off, you really should take the speedometer gear out. Okay, and this is pretty well rusted here, so hopefully it'll come out pretty easy. Yeah. Probably not. Let's see here. Now oh, it's pretty well in there. I'll put some of this penetrating oil in there and see if that helps. I'm spraying some penetrating oil on here because I gotta pull the shifter shaft out to disconnect it, the reverse shift fork from the reverse gear, and that'll allow me to slide the extension housing out a lot easier. Meanwhile, let's just see if this is oh man. Oh, there we go. So I'm going to just pry this out with some pliers. So hopefully I can just now kind of take this and pull it out. I have these brand new. So this too is doesn't want to move. So by the way, the three bolts on the top here, one, two, and three, are three-quarter inch hex head bolts. The two on the bottom that go from the tail to the mid plate are five-eighths of an inch hex head bolts. A lot of silicone sealer in this one here. Now these tails, on the T10s, unlike the Muncie's, have a pin that goes right through. So there's a dowel pin over here that goes right through here, through the mid plate to the case. So what you want to do is you want to punch that pin through. You can actually punch it through until it actually falls into the case, but that's good enough. We just want to clear a couple of things here. And it's really tight because it's probably been corroded for a long time. I'm just going to try to see if I can just spray some stuff in here. Some oil. If you look hard enough, there's usually places that you can pry against without really damaging the case. So some voids in the area. So you can see what I'm talking about. Because we attached this reverse gear, it's going to be very hard to move this out of the way. We'll do our best.
and you have that. So on the very bottom here we have another shallow three-quarter inch hex head bolt. Now unlike the Super T10, this whole gear train will pull out with no problem at all. It doesn't interfere with the cluster at all. It's very easy to pull this out. So we're going to just pull this whole thing out and set it aside, take the cluster out and the input, and then work from there. Alright, so oftentimes these input shafts are loose within these front bearings. So I'm going to take the snap ring off. Kind of tight. Let's just see if we can just stiff it. That's pretty tight actually. Take this off here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just drop the counter gear down by punching this counter shaft out and then I could take the input shaft out with the bearing, take the bearing off in a press, but we're really going to not use this whole gear set anyway, so, but I'll just tell you how I take it apart. So these counter shafts have a Woodruff key in them over here. The Woodruff key will usually fall out, but this is really gunked up with a lot of uh, sealant and slime. But surprisingly, for the age of this transmission, the counter shaft has got some wear in it, but it hasn't really started to spall just a little bit underneath first gear. That means spalling means that it's taking a little bit of the hardness off of the shaft. But other than that, it's not too bad. Take out the reverse idle gear here. Just out of the way. Now that the counter gear is dropped down, all right? It's dropped down. I can actually just tap this whole thing out of the box. I might be using, let's say, normally a rubber mallet, maybe. But these gears are shot anyway, so they're not in too good shape. They're all rusted and pitted and worn out, but surprisingly not in too bad a shape, but the front's pretty well hammered anyway. Inside here, there's going to be needle bearings that are going to be inside this, but they already fell out. Now you can pull the counter gear out. pretty well gunked up inside, okay? It's gonna let this go aside for a bit here. Interesting, okay? Right, so here I wanna show you the breakage of the gear. Look at that. See that? Missing a few teeth. It's amazing because the gears themselves were actually worn pretty nice, but over the years, fatigue and just hammering the transmission, this is what'll happen. And so you got broken gears, you could, these gears are actually not available. You have to try to find some new old stock counter gears if you wanted to fix this box up. But again, I'm going to convert it all to late model Super T10 stuff. And here's the difference. This is what the Super T10 gear is going to look like that's going to go in there now. Tooth profiles are a little bit wider, but the teeth are th much more beefier. Okay? So this is what we're going to convert this over to. All right, so here we have that main shaft, and as you can see, it is twisted. There's a nice twist in it over here. Kind of starts right about here, and then works its way down. I've got a brand new yoke here, and what I want to do is, just want to show you, if I put this yoke on, and it just stops right where the twist is, see? So a lot of times people 
are buying these transmissions and they put a yoke in the back and it doesn't go in all the way, it's because the main shaft is actually twisted. Oftentimes the yoke will actually twist with the main shaft, so it's better to keep the old yoke with it. A lot of times they're still on center, believe it or not, but they just twist. It's when they start cracking is when they're bad. So these splines are just square splines and that's why they tend to twist. Plus the metallurgy really wasn't that good. We're going to replace this output shaft with a 27 spline output shaft. These are square splines. These are what's called involute splines. So they're much more stronger. So again, we're gonna go from 16 to 27 spline main shaft now. So let's go take apart this main shaft now. These early T10 main shafts come apart pretty easy. You've got a snap ring for the 3-4 synchronizer hub. A lot of times you could just hold the third speed gear and tap on the output shaft and the whole third gear and the synchronizer assembly will come right off. Now on these early T10s there's a thrust bearing in them over here. See this bearing? And you don't, they usually don't go bad and you don't want to lose them because they're no longer available. Although I believe on one of the Ford uh, automatic overdrive transmissions there's a similar bearing that can be used if you can find it. But the unique thing about this is that the third gear and the second gear thrust against each other by use of a bearing. There is no flange over here that they thrust against. They thrust against. Also, if you're going to notice over here, there is a drill mark here, which means that this was a 9310 nickel gear set, and it still got destroyed. The third gear is messed up. Second gear will come off too. Oftentimes there might be a lip here, so you just give it a little bit of a tap. If it doesn't want to come off that way, because of the lip on this main shaft here, what, what's happened here is that the end play was a little bit too tight and it actually smeared this over here. There's a little bit of a, a groove here, like a lip here, cut right onto it. So you don't want to really force the gear off. If it doesn't come off, let it be. We could take it off the other way. Or you can go in there with a file and clean it up. We'll do that, see what happens. Like sometimes you can just go in here like this and clean it up. If it's already soft, it probably will just knock that lip right off of it. See? There we go. This gear is completely wasted. The engagement teeth on the gear are completely shot. Now you want to remove this rear snap ring on here. Try to find a way to get in here. It's already pretty loose. Sometimes you got to use a combination of either the straight tip or the angle tip snap ring pliers to get these things out. This is pretty sloppy. I'm not going to show you how to put it on the press. It's just pretty easy. You're going to press over here. You're going to put your press clamps over here. You're going to support it this way. Now, if you look at what's going on here, you can see that the first gear is moving. So by supporting under the one, two hub and pushing the whole main shaft through it this way, what I'm going to do is pull the one, two synchronizer assembly hub, the first gear, the first gear bushing, this bearing for the and mid plate, it's going to push the snapping up against the reverse gear. The reverse gear is going to push the pressed on speedo gear off. Everything is going to come off in one shot, just like that. Oftentimes, these things aren't that tight, and you can actually just tap them. They might move a little bit, which this one is. You see, so if you watch over here, the whole thing is coming right out pretty easy. The problem is, is that you still got to deal with this over here. 
and this is a press fit. So even though these may be loose, oftentimes it's a lot easier to put the whole thing on the press and just pull the whole thing off. All right, so here we have it. You can see how I just pressed everything right through, including the speedometer gear. Now on these early T10s, there is a thrust washer behind first speed gear. That's this one here. There's the first speed gear, first gear bushing, synchronizer ring, and the one two assembly. So the reason why I decided to do this job is just to show you that we've got transmissions that are 60 years old, synchronizer assemblies are shot, all the teeth are bad on the sliders and hubs. These early hubs too were soft, they weren't hard. All the engagement teeth are just destroyed on these gears, even first speed gear. So the gears are all garbage, maybe we got a good bushing out of it. The main shaft is bad, it's twisted. The reverse gear has got some use to it. It's still got some point definition to it. It's not bad. I'll put that aside. So let's go look at the speedometer gear. You can see it's all banged up from somebody working it over with a hammer. Oftentimes, if you do the technique that I said, putting everything on a press and pulling it all through, you'll never damage the speedometer gear that way. It'll come off nice and easy, and you could reuse it. But a lot of unprofessional people don't know those simple tricks and they start beating them off with a hammer and they damage the teeth on it, as you can see over here, and it becomes junk. And this is like a $30 part. There's no need for this to ever have been damaged, but it was damaged because people just don't know how to do things properly. So, and when you put it back on, you heat, heat it up and shrink it into place. So again, press, hammers, nothing ever gets in danger of damaging it in any way at all that way. But, so this is junk too. So we've really got nothing here left. We've got a mid plate that's kind of hammered and beat up, but it's still good to use for somebody who maybe want to be using it for some nostalgic purposes. But I always put new billet mid plates on my T10s that I build them. So what we got here is the billet mid plate, tail housing, all that stuff like that that we'll put. But all this stuff is going to go in the garbage. So, by the way, my voice sounds like this because I got back from the SEMA show a few weeks ago and got a bad case of the flu. I'm trying to recover, but it isn't too good. So please bear with my voice anyway. But I wanted to mention that please read the video description because I put a link to one of the other videos that I have a more detailed assembly of the main shaft. I'm not going to go through a complete assembly of the main shaft in this video because I've already done that in several other videos on Super T10s. So links are below in the video description and please watch those videos so you can get a better understanding how everything goes together. Also, uh, when you build these units or any type of transmission where you're doing custom work, what I tend to do is I try to pre-fit everything. So I will pre-fit the case onto the uh, and mid-plate together with the extension housing and just make sure that everything fits properly. It's very important because a lot of times you might have a little ding in the case or a little raised edge somewhere and you're just trying to slap the unit together and before you know it, you're going to get leaks. So what I always do is I go through everything and I put the case, the mid plate, the extension housing on it. I eye it up and I make sure that there is nothing that is cocked sideways or there's any air gaps in between anything. And that way, at least I get a good visual that it's going to go together correctly. And on the main shaft, it, because this is a custom shaft, I'm going to also make sure that the speedometer gear is in the right location uh, for the output shaft, you know, where it's on it, so that it lines up correctly with the extension housing. So I try to do all these little details before I put the whole transmission together, and that's very important. I'm also going to use uh, a billet mid plate on here. Uh, I've got rid of the uh, the cast one, it was kind of dinged up, and so I love these new billet mid plates that we have, and I'm going to put it together. It's going to be a really sweet unit, so let's get to putting it together. All right, so here I have that conversion main shaft with the first, second, and third speed gears, the one, two synchronizer assembly, and the three, four synchronizer assembly. As you can see, this main shaft has a flange on it, unlike the other one that just had this kind of thrust bearing on it, all right? So it's a much more beefier setup, and the 
Super T10 gears are much more beefier gears compared to the early T10 gears. But I've trial fit all the gears to the main shaft. In other words, I've honed the insides of the gears out, make sure they're nice and smooth, they fit well, fit the rings to the gears, and so forth. I've fit the sliders to the hubs properly, made sure that there's no burrs on anything, did everything I can to make sure that everything goes together nice and smoothly and functions smoothly. This is a conversion bushing that I manufacture along with this main shaft. This bushing has a little bit of a shoulder in here to go over this step area that normally is used in the first design uh, Super T10. There's a snap ring over here. So we don't have a snap ring on it. It's going to use this conversion piece that's going to go over this piece like this. And it's going to use this thrust washer on it over here so we can use a late model first speed gear in place of the early first design gear. This whole setup will go in together and it'll basically then be a 288 ratio in early T10 configuration for this 61 Corvette, I think it is. All right, so here's what that conversion bushing looks like. Now this conversion bushing again can be used on any first design Super T10 main shaft to convert it to a first gear that's of the second design that uses a bushing so that the gear doesn't seize onto the main shaft. Clearances are perfect on this. It's gonna come out really good. Spins nice and free, locks up good. See? A little pressure. Beautiful. So oftentimes, by the way, you might need to find out where the position of the speedometer gear needs to go on the main shaft. And all you have to remember is that it has to be somewhat centered in the hole over here. So when your pencil gear goes in there, it is kind of riding on the center of the gear like so. All right, so what I usually do is I just put the extension housing against the mid plate. I take a Sharpie and I go in there right on the center and I just make a mark on the main shaft. That's all I do. So now that I've got the mark over here, right? All I do is I lay the gear on it, get it in the center of the mark, and I'll just put a line where the gear has to go down to, like that. And that's how I know how to put it. So it's going to go, when it's covering it, it should be about like that and be fine. Now we have a gasket that goes on there, 15 thousandths isn't going to make a difference for the gasket, but that's what we do. I like to get these to where they just start to change color. Then I'll do is I'll just take some oil. Cool it. All right, so I'm making some progress here. Got the extension housing on with the billet mid plate. Beautiful 288 first gear, Super T10 gear set in a brand new case. I want you to take note that the case has also got a vent on it now that I put on here. And we're going to put in these beautiful forged steel bearing retainers. All right, take a look at this. It's nice, huh? That's going to go in the front. Also going to put in a brand new speedometer fitting now as well with the correct gear for the ratio and tire size that this gentleman has. I want to also let you know that I use these Permatex 51813 between all the gaskets. I'm also using the Permatex new orange uh, thread locker gel. It's almost as strong as red, but you don't have to heat it to, get, to remove it. It uh, will break away. And what I like about the gels is that I can just kind of put them on and they kind of stay in place. You see? And you can just do your bolts like that and not have to worry about it running off the bolts. So I always use these new Spadama fittings because they got seals in them. Some of the older fittings don't have seals. I'll grease everything put it in place, grease the o-ring, snap it down in there. Okay, so by the way, always grease the seal. 
when you're doing output shaft or input shaft seals, always run some grease on the lip. Also, I put grease in the inside to hold the spring in place, especially if you're hitting it in with a hammer or something like that. But you uh, initial fire up, what it does is it prevents basically the rubber burning up on a dry input shaft before the oil gets up in there. So it's always a good idea to pre-grease all your seals before you, you put the transmission together. These side cover bolts and the front bearing retainer bolts get torqued down between 15 and 20 foot pounds. I usually set them at 18. It's also a good idea if you want to have professional results, just wipe away any excess sealant that may squash out, okay? A lot of people don't do that, and I get so many transmissions in where there's just sealant sticking out all outside of the unit, so uh, it's a little extra step to do this, but it makes your job look nice and professional, which is what we all should be doing, right? I'm going to use an iron side cover instead of the aluminum cover. Aluminum covers kind of beat inside the bores, and I don't like these covers. They have a tendency to crack. So we're going to put an iron cover back onto this. But as I mentioned, too, is that when you're doing any type of these setups, put everything together first to see how it works. So this is the old interlock sleeve. I put it in here. <clears throat> Smock everything up first so you don't run into problems. So here we have it. In neutral and it works that way fine and then if I put it here it doesn't work that way okay it's too tight so we got to grind a little bit off the barrel and make it work and since this barrel looks hammered on the ends anyway I'll put a new barrel in I'll probably have the same issue it's in neutral that's tight there as well you can't move them all right, so it's going to take a little bit off the barrel, a little bit at a time on a grinder to get it so it works properly. All right, so I ground the barrel down. So you can see here I got this one in neutral. This is nice and free. Put that one in neutral. That moves nice and free and still interlocks it. All right, that's so what's important. You got to check all these things out. And also, a lot of times these barrels, if they're old, they can be mushroomed at the end and not go through all the way. So you want to make sure that they slide nice and easy through everything over here, okay? Right, on any T10 transmission, when you got a Super T10, first design, second design, or early T10, best way to put the side cover on is lay the forks in like this, but make sure it's in second gear and make sure the cover is in second gear and then everything should drop right down like this with no problem at all. So here we have the completed transmission. You've got the Richmond Super T10 main case, brand new, billet mid plate, early 60s extension housing, coupled to a 27 spline output shaft, 26 spline input shaft, but a brand new Super T10 288 gear set. This whole transmission will go in any C1 Corvette, fit perfectly inside of it, and the shifter will come out in the right location. You could use your OEM shifter or a brand new Hurst shifter if you like. So a nice easy conversion of going from this rusty, crummy, early T10 transmission to a modern day four speed transmission that shifts great and will also give you the ability to have better gear ratios. So you can run, for example, a 308 rear in that car, have the advantage of almost a five speed transmission and yet have a great first gear to get the benefit of good sporty acceleration and have a wonderful, enjoyable ride. Thanks for watching. See you soon.